This part of the test will measure your listening ability when it comes to the conversations and lectures in academic settings. You will listen to a recording and then answer questions about it. You will be able to take notes while listening and you can listen to the recording only once. The questions must be answered in the presented order. During the exam, you will not be allowed to go back to the previous question. The questions will be about the main idea and the supporting details. Some questions will be about the speaker's purpose or attitude. Answer the questions based on what is stated or implied by the speaker. Sometimes you will see this icon. It means that you will have to listen to a certain segment of the recording and answer a question about it. Now listen to the lecture. Let's start with the early 20th century, when commercial flying first appeared. The first ever regularly scheduled commercial passenger flight occurred in 1914, traveling only a short distance between two locations in Florida. An early airboat line used a wooden airboat with a 75 horsepower motor for its 23-minute flight. This modest beginning, despite its crude design, was a turning point in aviation history because it showed that scheduled air travel might be a practical mode of transportation. In the 1920s and 1930s, as infrastructure and technology advanced, commercial aviation grew rapidly and a large number of aircraft manufacturers entered the industry. The tri-motor airplane, the cutting-edge passenger aircraft, and the streamlined airliner are three significant aircraft types from this era that stand out for their impact on the development of commercial air travel. The mid-1920s saw the introduction of the tri-motor airplane, which had three radial engines and a metal frame. One of the first commercial flights could accommodate larger groups. It could carry up to 12 passengers. The tri-motor plane was renowned for its durability, and although not being the fastest, it was dependable and set the bar for passenger aircraft at the time. Developed in the early 1930s, the revolutionary passenger aircraft revolutionized commercial aviation by being able to travel farther and faster than its forerunners. This kind of aircraft marked a turning point for the industry since it brought about an era of airline profitability and increased public access to commercial air travel. Its unique design, which could accommodate 21 to 32 passengers, served as the model for numerous subsequent airplanes. In the early 1930s, the streamlined airliner, another significant category of aircraft from, had its first flight. The sleek airliner was an important breakthrough, even if it did not enjoy the same level of popularity as the groundbreaking passenger aircraft. It featured a number of innovations that would later become commonplace in commercial aircraft. The aircraft was the first commercial aircraft to include retractable landing gear and featured a more streamlined design, increased speed, and enhanced range. What is the main idea of the lecture? Which of the following is not mentioned as an early commercial plane? What did the professor mean when he said? This kind of aircraft marked a turning point for the industry.
What was the significance of the wooden airboat used in the first scheduled commercial flight? Why does the professor say, the trimotor airplane was, although not being the fastest, but was, dependable and set the bar? What was one key characteristic that distinguished the streamlined airliner from its predecessors? Now listen to the conversation between two people. Good morning, James. I wanted to discuss an exciting opportunity with you today. Hi, Professor Anderson. I'm all ears. What's the opportunity? Our research team has recently obtained funding for an upcoming project, and we're looking to recruit interns for the summer. I think you might be a great fit. Wow, that sounds incredible. I'm definitely intrigued. Could you provide more details about the project? Of course. The project will investigate the effects of climate change on marine ecosystems. We'll be doing field work along the coastline and later analyzing the collected data in the lab. It seems like a fantastic learning opportunity. Marine biology has always been a passion of mine. Your dedication is evident in your work, which is why I think you'd be a valuable asset to our team. The internship comes with a stipend, and you'll get the chance to collaborate closely with experienced researchers. I truly appreciate you thinking of me for this, Professor Anderson. I'm thrilled and honored by the possibility. What do I need to do next? It's great to hear that you're enthusiastic. Please submit your CV and a brief statement of interest to me by next week, and then I'll go over your application with the team. What is the main idea of the dialogue? How does James feel about the internship opportunity? What is the professor's opinion on James' suitability for the internship?
What is the professor implying about the internship opportunity? What does the professor request James to do next? Now listen to the lecture. Beavers are herbivores, which means they eat mostly plant material. Their main food sources include water plants, tree bark, twigs, and leaves. Alder, aspen, willow, cottonwood, and other tree types are favorites of beavers. However, depending on the amount of food supplies in their habitat, this choice may fluctuate. Beavers are extremely versatile animals that can change their food to suit their surroundings. Beavers rely on a supply of underwater stored branches and twigs near their lodge during the winter. Their survival during this difficult winter, when the water surface freezes and access to food is restricted, is ensured by this cache, which was built in the autumn. Beavers, however, eat a range of aquatic vegetation, including water lilies and pondweed, during the warmer months. The beaver's capacity for environmental adaptation is highlighted by the seasonal variations in their food. Beavers are extremely adaptable, but they are nevertheless susceptible to the effects of human activity. The availability of the preferred tree species for beavers may dwindle as humans continue to intrude on their habitats. Because of this, beavers might be forced to eat less, which could ultimately harm their general health and well-being. Additionally, the loss of the beneficial ecological services that beavers perform, such as the filtration of water and the development of habitat for other species, could result from this drop in preferred food sources. It is important to remember that the ecology is greatly impacted by the feeding habits of beavers. Beavers cut down trees and consume vegetation resulting in wide spaces that let sunlight into the forest floor and encourage the development of a more diversified plant life. Beavers are nature's gardeners in a way. Additionally, they built wetlands through the construction of dams, which serve as crucial habitats for a variety of species, including fish, birds, and amphibians. These same operations, nevertheless, can also result in precious timber being lost and flooded human infrastructure. To sum up, beavers are herbivores whose main food sources include water plants, tree bark, twigs, and leaves. Their eating habits have a big impact on the ecology, and their food preferences vary based on their habitat and the availability of resources. Understanding the food of beavers and its broader implications is crucial for their protection as human activities continue to endanger their ecosystems. What is the main idea of the lecture? How does the professor feel about beaver's adaptability?
What did the professor mean when he said, Beavers are nature's gardeners in a way. Why does the professor mention the decline in preferred food sources for beavers? Sort the following items into those that are part of the beaver's diet and those that are not. How do beavers' feeding habits affect the growth of plant communities in their habitat? Now listen to the conversation between two people. Hi, I was hoping to talk about my future career prospects. I'm not sure what field I should pursue after graduation. Of course, I'd be happy to help. What are your main interests and strengths? I enjoy working with people and solving problems. I've been considering fields like marketing, human resources, and social work. Those are all great options. Have you had any internships or work experiences in these fields? To help you make a decision? Well, I had a marketing internship last summer, but I haven't had a chance to explore HR or social work. You could try to find a part time job or internship in HR or social work before you graduate. This way, you'll have more hands on experience to inform your decision. That's true. Although I have some concerns about job security and income potential in those fields. I understand your concerns. While some fields may have more job stability or higher income potential, it's important to consider your passion and fulfillment in your career as well. You're right. I should probably explore all my options before making a decision. That's a wise approach. I can help you research job opportunities and growth potential in each field if you'd like. That would be great. Thank you for your guidance. You're welcome. Remember, the right career path for you will become clear as you gain more experience and knowledge about each field. What is the main purpose of the dialogue? What does the student imply about their concerns?
What is the career counselor's attitude towards the student's concerns? What does the career counselor suggest the student do, to make a more informed decision? How does the student feel about the counselor's guidance? Now listen to the lecture. It is crucial to realize that songs had a significant role in daily life in ancient Rome. They were present for a variety of events, including banquets, plays, military marches, and gladiatorial contests. They were also used as teaching tools to help people remember historical facts or convey moral principles. Songs that honored the historical heroes and mythology of the Roman people frequently demonstrated their respect for their cultural heritage. Latin language use was one of the primary elements of ancient Roman songs. The language is distinguished by a sophisticated system of word endings and cases that can convey complex thoughts and emotions, allowing for a wide spectrum of expression. Latin was crucial for writing songs that could arouse strong emotions in their audience, so enhancing their impact. Ancient Roman songs Distinctive melodic structure is another remarkable feature. Instead of using a standardized method of notation like we do today, the Romans passed down their songs orally and through memory. Due to the absence of a set framework, the musical environment became diversified and was continuously changing. Roman music does, however, have certain defining qualities. For instance, the majority of songs had a distinct rhythmic structure that alternated between long and short syllable patterns, or quantitative meters. This made it possible for a unique and captivating melodic flow, which significantly added to the song's appeal. Due to the lack of musical notation and surviving sources, it is challenging to entirely reconstruct ancient Roman songs. However, several findings have provided us with a look into this thriving artistic world. One such instance is the Carmen Avail, a fragmentary ballad from the 1st century A.D. that is devoted to the agrarian deity. The Romans felt that a healthy relationship between man and nature was essential for a thriving civilization, and this idea is emphasized in the song's lyrics. It is important to recognize the expressive force of the music of ancient Rome. They were used as a form of communication and were able to express a variety of emotions. Songs have the power to unite people during joyful occasions and comfort them during sad ones. Additionally, they gave the Romans a way to communicate with the past and display their cultural identity. What is the main idea of the lecture?
According to the professor, what was one of the reasons that Latin was essential for creating ancient Roman songs? The professor implies that the rhythmic structure of ancient Roman songs played a significant role in In the lecture, the professor discusses the Carmen Arvale as an example of ancient Roman songs. What can be inferred about the song's purpose or message? What is the professor's attitude towards the study of ancient Roman songs? The professor states, It is important to recognize the expressive force of the music of ancient Rome. What deeper meaning can be inferred from this statement? <laughs> 